my career began as an acoustics engineer. So I ran, actually founded my own acoustics engineering company when I was a young man. And I ran it for 30 straight years. And it was very successful. Not, not a huge business like a million pounds or a million dollars or whatever, you know, that kind of size. Um, and But just a couple of years before I sold that business, an event occurred in my life as you mentioned, in the Great Pyramid of Egypt, which actually caused me to sell my business. And not only that, but also to change career paths entirely. And what happened was my daddy and I had traveled in Egypt many times, but on this particular occasion, we found ourselves in the Great Pyramid, in the King's Chamber, which is, has an astonishing acoustic. And we were there alone. You know, this didn't happen because we'd planned it. It was just pure chance. But on other, on previous occasions, we had been in there and we'd been in with a lot of other tourists making noise. And it's a little bit like, I can liken it if, if for those listeners, viewers who have not actually experienced this themselves in the Great Pyramid of Egypt, I can liken it to going into a a church, a mosque, a synagogue, you know, some some sacred space um, of a religious nature anyway, that where you expect silence, you expect reverence, you know, and <laughs> when you have a gaggle of tourists making a lot of noise, of course, you, you just can't achieve that. You know, you can't, you can't um, sense the spirit of the place. But in this case, because we were all alone, it was a really wonderful experience. And one of the things that I wanted to do, I'd always wanted to do, was to lie in the sarcophagus. This is a, a basically a, a like a coffin, you could say, of granite. It's, it was obviously originally a block of granite that had been hollowed out. A lot of people think that the pharaoh, certainly mainstream Egyptology, think that the pharaoh Khufu was at one time interred in that in that coffin, in that sarcophagus. Many other people take a completely different view that it was never intended to be a an in, a place of interment. Anyway, regardless of you know of that argument, I had always wanted to lie in it. Why? Because as an acoustics engineer at that time, I was fascinated by the acoustics in the chamber as a whole, but also this sarcophagus is highly resonant. What I mean by that is. If you strike the side of it with your fist, for example, any of the sides, it rings like a low-pitched bell and it has a beautiful sound. It's not a single frequency that it creates. It's kind of a, you know, an array of frequencies, very beautiful, very low-pitched, but nevertheless very beautiful. Anyway, so I was interested in the resonant properties. And so I knew that if I lie, lay in it and made a, a vocal glissando um, that at one particular pitch one particular vocal pitch there would be a, a prime resonant frequency a frequency at which the sarcophagus really became excited because of my vocal energy i knew that in advance obviously but you know doing it's another thing and so anyway i took this opportunity to lie in it my daddy just stood there very quietly and and watching and listening and Certainly, it, this is exactly what happened at one particular vocal pitch that I later discovered was 117 hertz. It's a B, very close to a B flat. Every cell in my body seemed to tingle, well, did tingle, and uh, goosebumps broke out all over my flesh. It was an amazing experience, and it was a kind of, I don't just call it a wave of acoustic energy that was washing up and down my spine. and. At that point in my career, as I mentioned earlier, I had been an acoustics engineer for almost 30 years, never experienced anything close to that uh, in all of the experiences that I had. And so I knew that this was something very special and it seemed to suggest to me design. You know, I thought that this is probably not happenstance, this is suggesting design. And so what I wanted to do, um, was basically to go back to the pyramid armed with a lot of acoustics instrumentation. So cutting this story very short, I, I did exactly that. The next year, I gained permission to go back. 
and I carried out a series of very, well, what any acoustics engineer would consider to be standard acoustics tests. They were all very successful. And one in particular was an amazing experience because the whole sarcophagus began to beat like a like a beating heart. These were beat frequencies for those of you who know what they are. But they, these were very powerful beats, just like a heart beating. And uh, the antiquities inspector who was with me in, on that occasion, he thought I was going to damage the sarcophagus. He kind of rushed over to me. What do you do? What do you do? You... Anyway, of course, it wasn't going to damage the sarcophagus. These were just purely powerful beat frequencies. But anyway, there's a whole story related to that, to what these frequencies mean, what these beats mean in relation to the... Um, to the rebirth symbolism of the pyramid. What I really wanted to share with you all is is the 97 experiments, because the one particular experiment I couldn't conduct that year in 96 was a cymatics experiment. Uh, for those of you who don't know that word or what that means, it's basically the science of visible sound. So all the sounds around us are obviously impinging on all, all the surfaces around us, including our own body all of the time. And whenever that occurs, there will always be an imprint, a geometric imprint of those sound frequencies on the membranes, on the surfaces around us. This even goes right down into the cellular level. So even on the surface membrane of every cell in our body, obviously they have membranes, right? Then there's a, a cymatic pattern. And usually these patterns are very geometric in form. So this is the interplay between sound and membranes, essentially. And you might be thinking, well, you know, what about hard surfaces? Well, even hard surfaces. I mean, Ernst Kladny, who pretty much kick-started this science around about 1800, he was making visible sound on a metal plate. And you might think, well, how can sound make a metal plate vibrate in complex ways? Well, it does, you know, it really does. So if you, any of you want to look up Ernst Kladney, you'll find Kladney patterns. And these were kind of the precursor, ultimately, to the science of cymatics that we have today. Anyway, so getting back to this concept of sound impinging or imprinting onto membranes all around us, I w what I was interested to do was to stretch a membrane, PVC membrane, across the open top of the sarcophagus and then torsion, attention it with little bags of sand all around the perimeter to give it an even tension and then sprinkle sand on the membrane. Now, instead of me lying in the sarcophagus to make sound, now we would put a small speaker there and then make sound from an electronic oscillator, right? That's exactly the the essence of the experiment. Well, um, just to like backtrack a little bit, three weeks before going out to Egypt, something happened. It turned out to be a great gift, but at the time, <laughs> it, it was anything but. It was a, a, an injury to my lower back, quite a serious injury. I, I obviously did something very silly. I bent down at an angle, lifted something up. I think it was a toolbox. And oh my goodness, the pain was excruciating. Basically, it was a, a, a tear, muscle tear. Well, what happens in your body, in your spine, when you injure it in that way is a, a spasm. Basically, it's in medical terms, it's sometimes called a splinting circle, cycle rather. You know, like, how when you when you break a bone or something, you want to put a splint in there to to keep it straight. Well, in this case, um, the body makes its own splint in the form of a spasm of the muscles. All the muscles in that area that are not damaged, they all gather together and splint the uh, this area. And the splint itself causes way more pain than even the injury, right? So it's an extremely painful condition when you have a, you know, a back injury like that. And it can take many, many weeks, even months sometimes to heal. In this case, this was only three weeks before going out to Egypt. And I paid them a lot of money to conduct these experiments. You know, they don't let you do this for free. And so, I, again, cutting it very short, um, I just basically 
took a kind of more more painkillers and overdose you could say of painkillers to try and numb the pain to the degree that I could at least function as a human being so I had to crawl into the pyramid literally on my hands and knees in great pain other people carried in all of the equipment and somehow with the help of the antiquities inspector we set up this experiment in 1997 to make visible the resonances in that sarcophagus. Well, what happened was absolutely extraordinary. About 20 minutes into this experiment, we were just starting to make visible, uh, like sprinkle the sand on, turn on the oscillator and make some sound. Well, the first thing that happened was the first image that appeared on the membrane was an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph. Right? Well, you know, I had been expecting a geometric pattern. In fact, I thought, obviously, what we will see is a series of geometric patterns. And then later, you know, back in my lab, I will analyze them to learn more about the resonances in this granite box. And by the way, the granite, the granite itself from Aswan is about 20% quartz crystal. So this is the reason why it is so resonant because it has a very high percentage of quartz in it. Anyway, so, but to see an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph, never in my wildest dreams had I, you know, thought that that would, something like that would occur. And at this point, yeah. I, I, but are we saying like it kind of resembled a hieroglyph or like... Well, I have to say that, obviously, but, you know, initially, when I first saw it, I recognized it immediately as a hieroglyph. I, I knew what the form was, and the form, it, it's called the Jed, the D-J-E-D, the Jed pillar, and it's basically the backbone of the god Osiris in hieroglyphic terms, in the symbolism of ancient Egypt. And so, at this point, the antiquities inspector who had helped me to set it up, but then he went away and he was he was still in the chamber, but he was standing up against the north wall, filing his nails, actually, and looking rather bored and probably thinking this Englishman is a little bit, you know, not quite right in the head to be doing this and paying all his money. But anyway, uh, that's the kind of look he had on his face. But now when he saw what I was seeing, this hieroglyph, and it wasn't... It wasn't static, by the way. It was snaking. It was writhing. It was an amazing thing to, to watch. And so now he ran, he rushed across the chamber and he said, how you do that? How you do that? And he got very excited. And now he wanted to help to, to, with the experiment. And so we became a little team. And every time he was actually scraping the sand off and sprinkling fresh sand on while I was doing other things. Every time, or almost every time, we changed the frequency uh, that was, you know, driving into the sarcophagus, a new hieroglyph would appear, different hieroglyph this time, and then another. In between these hieroglyphs, by the way, there were some very strange, otherworldly kind of shapes. But every now and again, there would be this hieroglyph, another hieroglyph would appear, and many of them were very familiar to me. And to him, yes, I mean, obviously, we, we still have to say resemble hieroglyphs, yeah. but if there'd only been one, we could definitely say that for sure. But there were multiple hieroglyphs. And so I don't really think it's fair or, or reasonable to say that these resemble hieroglyphs. They are hieroglyphs, yeah. you know. For, so so and I do have a whole hypothesis as to how that could have occurred. 